Welcome to Spirit's Journey, coming to you live on Truth Frequency Radio and simulcast on Oneness Talk Radio. Your hosts are Patrick and Catherine Andres. Join us each week as we explore a wide range of metaphysical topics such as dreams, astrology, intuitive readings, and life purpose. You'll receive practical guidance so that you can live your most awesome life. Learn more about what we do at intuitiveschool.com and connect with us on Facebook at Spirit's Journey Radio. Welcome to Spirit's Journey. We are coming to you on Truth Frequency Radio, also being simulcast on One is Talk Radio, among others. You can find us on iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and TalkStream Live. We're here in the heartland, holding the energy for spiritual truth and awareness. I'm Patrick. And I'm Catherine. Welcome, everyone. So we have somebody here today from the heartland. We've got Reverend Dr. Paul Hasselback who, if you've been involved in the unity movement, are very well aware that he is one of the unity leading metaphysical authorities. He's written and has had a major role in bringing unity metaphysics into the 21st century. He has a passion and a skill for clarity, precision, and making unity teachings understandable. He served as an adjunct faculty member by Worldwide Unity Worldwide Spiritual Institute. He teaches for the Unity School of Christianity of Great Britain, New Zealand, and Australia, and was a full-time faculty member for Unity Institute, Dean of Spiritual Education and Enrichment Program for Unity Institute, a retreat minister for Unity Village, and minister of pastoral care and prayer for Unity Church of Overland Park. Paul has a host of books that he has written, nine altogether, and his most recent book that we will most likely talk about today is um, uses the truth you know, Unity's Principles and Premises. Welcome, Paul. Hey, Paul. Hey, hey, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, it's always great to talk to a fellow uh, Unity person because we're on the same wavelength here. And we, of course, we could talk for months and months because Unity is so vast and broad. So why don't we begin by you just kind of sharing how did you get involved in metaphysics and Unity? Well, my primary doorway into metaphysics, let's say 20th century metaphysics, was through A Course in Miracles, which I discovered while living in Puerto Rico. Um, Like most Course in Miracles students, I resisted it for a while, and then I actually started reading the book and got really, really involved, and that led to groups that were meeting in Puerto Rico in both English and Spanish, Then our English group wanted to have a service, and so we asked the unity minister in Santurce, Puerto Rico, if she'd be willing to host English services, and she agreed. And so that's how I got and found unity. In fact, our English group founded a unity church before we even knew what unity was. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's great. So uh, we had a little bit of uh, experience with Course of Miracles too, and um, how did you find kind of those early days? You know, you said you were kind of resistant to studying it, and then kind of got into it. Um, you know, how did how did you experience those early days studying Course of Miracles? Well, so to be more precise, I had close friends that were studying it, and they were they were like evangelical Course of Miracles people, and. St- so it just felt like they were forcing it on me and forcing it on me. So uh, I sort of naturally pushed back from that. And of course, I don't know how many copies I was given, but finally I did pick one up and I was intrigued. And so that intrigue got me going. That's interesting. That's kind of my experience too, where, you know, being in the field of metaphysics, you imagine you run into a lot of people who have been studying Course in Miracles. And when you talk to people about their background and some of the things that they did early on, it's amazing how many people have had contact with that, even though they may not have gone through the entire course, just how many people have had some kind of contact with it. And so over time, you know, initially I felt like, well, you know, that's, that's their path. It's not really my path, but it kept coming up. And then there was a certain point where I just felt like I really need to look into it. I haven't really made it a serious study like a lot of people have, you know, where some people have gone through the book, you know, three and four times, things like that, because uh, I have kind of more of an eclectic study. But yeah, it was a very interesting study. It did give a very unique perspective compared to some of the other 
uh, teachings that I had studied along the way. Well, what would you say, Paul, is, are the similarities and some of the differences with Unity and A Course in Miracles? Well, there's a whole book on that. Unity and A Course in Miracles I co-wrote with Reverend Bill Heller. Um, the similarities are much, there's more similarities than there are distinctions. And often uh, the distinctions create a kind of synergy that I think amps up a person in their spiritual path. And so if, if you look at Unity's five basic principles, you can find those in Course in Miracles, and that's the most basic level to start. So um, you, you can find you, in Unity, God defined as mind, and you find God defined as mind in A Course in Miracles. Both believe that we have that Christ presence, whatever you want to call it, within us. So that's the second principle. Course in Miracles Unity both teach about the power of thought and our thinking natures, and both advocate strongly prayer. In fact, there's a little booklet called The Song of Prayer that is an adjunct to A Course in Miracles. And then, of course, the fifth principle is uh, practice the truth you know. And Course in Miracles comes with 365 lessons to do that. So they're just in the five basic principles, it completely lines up. Now, what about um, with forgiveness? Because I know a lot of people say, well, I totally shifted my idea of forgiveness when I studied Course in Miracles. Um, and I'm not really quite sure Unity's, um, for, you know, at least presentation that I've seen of forgiveness is the same. What would you say about that? And, and so they, so for me, they are the same because both talk about forgiveness being a shift in perception. And after all, what a miracle is, is a shift in perception. And that's a shift from seeing through um, sense consciousness, let's say it that way, to shifting to a view or seeing from our higher consciousness. And so the, the concepts are very parallel. In, in unity, forgiveness is all about letting go of everything I've added to your Christ nature. And then by doing that, I can cl more clearly see your Christ nature. And so that's a shift in perception. So for me, they're very similar. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's all about perception. Oh, my gosh. Um, right. So what about, I mean, let's get to the core, God. So I know you've written a lot about that. Obviously, you teach a lot about that. It's covered both in A Course in Miracles and Unity. So how can we bring it down to a level that can help people today with everything going on in the world? Those of us, those people who feel out of touch for example, with the creator, how do we help them? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And the reason why it's a great question is because unity has uh, one of the best answers. First of all, we stop calling God, God, because that brings up all of our childhood beliefs about God. And unity is very unique. If you really get down to some of the core things that, that especially Charles said, which often does not see the light of day. And that is, God doesn't use us, we use God. And so I can't think of many other or any other spiritual tradition that teaches that. And when you say that way, use God, people cringe. However, you gotta understand how Charles is using the language. So, in a little book called The Revealing Word, which contains lots of definitions, under the word mind, capital M, mind, it says, by mind we mean God, the universal principle which contains all principles. And so both Myrtle and Charles saw God as this principle that includes all other principles. And if you can name the principles, and if you, if you realize that the principles don't use you, that you use principles, then knowing about God or principle becomes very, very practical 
in whatever, whatever time you're living in. So that brings up an interesting point because I believe there's a lot of people who have moved away from this old man sitting on a mountain, you know, pointing his finger down on us kind of image of God uh, to more of a, at least in the metaphysical community and unity community, they see God as this maybe divine being of spiritual energy that's everywhere present at all times. But from what you're describing, it, does that still fit in with God being uh, an intelligent being? Or are you really shifting no, more? God is not a being. God is not an entity. A lot of people in unity and new thought and metaphysical circles still conceive of a God that maybe it no longer has a physical form, as we might have thought as a child, but it certainly has all the characteristics of that God. So it has the ability to offer you grace and forgiveness and blessings and do things for you and also to punish you. And all of that gets let go in this more absolute understanding that's found in the Unity writings. Yeah, that's really interesting because uh, I know in my early studies in metaphysics, a lot of times we just refer to mind. You know, we just... Yes. And... Yeah. And when people would ask us, you know, do you believe in God? You know, we would say yes, but we were really talking about mind and we were talking about principles of mind. And uh, so I can see a lot more similarities in there, there now as you're describing this than I yeah, originally so did. We, one of the problems with mind is when people hear that, they think of it like us having a little M mind. And in fact, as time went on, even in the Unity writings, they talked about the mind of God, that there's this God that has a mind, which again is very anthropomorphic. However, in the earlier writings, they were very, very precise by saying, saying or writing God dash mind. In other words, like you were saying it, God doesn't have a mind, God is mind. And of course, as I just read or shared with you, I didn't read it, um, that's a quote I have memorized, is, is that for Fillmore, universal principle was a synonym for mind. And that principle contains all principles. So then how do we connect with the people who are really invested in this idea of a personal relationship with God and a personal relationship with Jesus? And, uh, you know, uh, describing... Uh, the principles in mind the way you are, that would also change our relationship with Jesus and Jesus' relationship with uh, what he described as father, right? Not, not really. So why don't we just take those one at a time? Sure. Okay. So I, I get that question that, or that, let's call it pushback. Well, I can't have a, a relationship with principle. And on the surface, that looks true because obviously principle seems seems cold and inanimate. However, human beings has, have this capacity to create a relationship with almost anything. How many people talk to their cars, for example, <laughs> right. love their cars, or, or when we were little, teddy bears, okay? And, and let, so if, if this point of view that God is principle is true, then we could say to those people, look how powerful you are. You're making up a relationship with a being that doesn't even exist. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, yeah. And then if, so let's look at Jesus next. Well, first of all, we got to be really clear uh, in case there's some new listeners that when we talk about Jesus or when I talk about Jesus or Charles and Myrtle talked about Jesus, they're talking about the man, the person that lived over 2,000 years ago and realized that he had this Christ nature, this divinity within him, and, and learned how to express it the best he could. And we all agree he did a pretty good job. So that God is principle doesn't interfere with that one bit. And 
it's, it's just as easy to think that Jesus has passed, moved on to other realms, and we can claim a relationship with Jesus, whether it's literally real or not, is irrelevant. Because we are so powerful, you will use that relationship in the best way for you. And, and Myrtle and Charles, I probably won't get this right, and you guys might know it, at the beginning of their classes would say, Jesus Christ is here now raising me to his level of consciousness. And, and then it goes on. So, so they believe the very, the very essence of Jesus was available to us. And again, Jesus is the man, not God. Yeah, so you brought up an interesting point there, and that was an, a follow-up question that I had because you were talking about Jesus going on to other realms. So if God is really the principle of mind, and you know, metaphysically speaking, like you were saying, a lot of people, when we say the mind, they think of just the brain and the brain interacting with the body in the physical world. But metaphysics really talks about that just being the conscious mind. And then we expand into the subconscious mind. And then from there, we expand into the superconscious mind. And then there's even realms of consciousness beyond that. So when we're really talking about this kind of new way of looking at God, where does that leave us in terms of our existence after this life, because that's a big concern for a lot of people. Like, you know, well, does so, our consciousness continue? Right. So first of all, it's not certain anything we've made up about it. And so I, I really, I'm, I'm going to answer this, but for myself, I just let it go. I'll, I'll figure that out when I pass from, from this state of consciousness. Though there's sufficient evidence to say that there are, are realms of existence beyond our physical existence, and especially with those people who have come back in, 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 a, in reincarnation, and especially kids who can remember past lives that can be, be verified. So there's something of us that's not physical that goes on. And it's just, to me, the best I can do, just another form of awareness or consciousness or, or something like that. And that realm, to me, is not principle, though principle is certainly available there. That, that's a good point. Yeah, I know a lot of people will, you know, debate for hours, and, you know, does reincarnation exist? And, you know, really, I get to the point where I say, you know what, it, what's most important is the here and now. <laughs> However, uh, you know, through our past life readings that we've been doing for 18 years, we have been able to unlock a lot of mysteries for people in terms of, you know, they've come into this lifetime with challenges or certain relationship issues, and they've never been able to get to the root of them until they actually do some past life exploration. So for some people, it can be valuable. For other people, you know, it's like, well, we'll just move on to, <laughs> to the next topic. Um, well, so, so... That's a usefulness in a very particular setting. And uh, I, I, I got training on how to do past life regressions too, back when I was living in Puerto Rico. And um, wh whether, that's, whether that regression is literally true or not, what is learned in that regression can be useful to the person who's living in this moment. And Catherine, I'm with you. So when that conversation of past lives and forward lives and all that begins in the classroom, I let it run a little bit. And, and then I say this. I used to explore that stuff almost nonstop. And then I had the realization, the energy and time that I'm investing trying to figure out something that I may not be able to know is is lost to my investing myself in this time, in this moment, and being a better person and helping others. Yeah, that, that's a good way as a teacher, I think, to, to maneuver around that. That's awesome. Um, well, and so we know, you know, the history of unity was, you know, based a lot about healing, where Fert Myrtle, you know, had illness and cured it through prayer. And so what I wanted to talk about and uh, get your viewpoint is, you know, with the whole coronavirus thing, honestly, I have to tell you that I was really shocked at the amount of people that I know who are in unity or metaphysics, 
who were freaked out and like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared of this virus. I'm locking myself in my house. And I was like, wait a minute, are you forgetting your unity principles? Like the whole thing of unity is we can heal ourselves of anything that we are, it's thought as cause. And I couldn't believe how many people just crumbled with a virus that actually turns out to be, you know, the same death rate or less as the flu. And so I wondered what, what your perspective was and, and the people you've been around and the response by Unity uh, to this, which to me was, was very disappointing. Okay, so first of all, uh, I would like you to understand that I have a medical background. So I, I was a former dentist and a scientist. So, so much like Fillmore, a lot of what I do and, and that is based in science. And a lot of Unity people don't really know the Unity teachings, first of all. They don't know the teachings. They have a very surface understanding. And, and when that surface gets disturbed, people go back to their, tend to go back to their default positions. And um, while I haven't been afraid of the virus, we live in a three-dimensional wor world. And I, I am very careful when I go out. And before we went on, I, I was a little surprised you went on an airplane and you said, you said that was fine. Simply knowing the truth and holding to principles gives you a leg up, but it doesn't prevent possible infection. Well, holding the truth and holding principle, what it does is it improves your immune system. Fear will lower your immune system, which means it's going to be more likely that you're going to get sick. So, I, I fall somewhere between where I think you're coming from and where those people, however you want to refer to them, are, are coming from. You know, if we can hold prayer in that and whatever you want. If you walk out in front of a car, you're going to get run over. And that's, that's just, just how this physical world acts. And no matter what Charles thought we would live forever, or he thought he could, he, he didn't, and who has, number one. And so we live in physical bodies that are susceptible to injury. Yeah, I've talked to more than one person who thought they were going to live forever, and so far none of them have. <laughs> Although, you know, like you were saying, it, you know, since I've studied metaphysics, it's not that I've never been sick since then, but I can track my health progress since I started studying metaphysics seriously. And my health has dramatically improved. You know, I got sick much less often. Whenever I did come down with something, it was much less severe. I got over it much more quickly than I did when I was younger before I really started studying. So, you know, like you're saying, I, I uh, you know, can see and, and agree with what you're talking about. That, you know, we are living in a physical world. There are going to be things going on. And the other thing is, too, you know, it's like even when we practice these principles, it doesn't mean we're always perfect. So, we could have underlying uh, thoughts or fears or doubts or criticisms of ourselves or all these different things that could be weakening our system that you know maybe sometimes we're not even aware of. And so, yeah, and th that that's our own system. However, right. we we are not we are not separate in any way, shape, or form from collective consciousness. And so, thoughts that are held, beliefs that are held in collective, can hold sway at the point of an individual. So with the, you know, actually, I kind of see Charles and Merle, they sort of had their own, uh, even though they weren't completely separate, they had their unique perspective, because, you know, Merle was very focused on prayer and healing. Charles, I felt like he was really the one who was working to get in there to really understand the principles and, and describe the principles as best he could. Uh, so what would be your best advice uh, to people, whether they practice unity principles or not, but uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, keeping the healthiest that they can, uh, I mean, especially with all these things going on right now that people are, uh, you know, so much in a fear mode, you know, what would be your greatest suggestion for people in terms of keep, staying really healthy? Yeah, so great question. Let's see if I can do this quickly. 
So uh, we are threefold beings. We are divine. We are consciousness. We are physical bodies. So we can't do anything about our divinity. Isn't that great? It simply is what it is. <laughs> and to me, uh, the easiest way to understand that is call it principle and law. And at the level of my mind or consciousness, being aware of those principles associated with a healthy body is important. That includes the 12 powers uh, that, and, and specifically uh, life. It includes substance. It includes health. It includes wholeness. And it includes intelligence at the very minimum. So knowing something about those is very important. And Myrtle said this, if, even if you're doing all of that and you're not doing what you need to do for your physical body to take care of it, you're not going to have as good as results. And so we've got to take care of our physical bodies as well. That means exercise. That means sleep. That means drinking plenty of water in this time of COVID. It means wearing masks. It means washing hands, uh, physical distancing, all of, all of that stuff. We, we, we must remember we are threefold and not treat any one as separate. All right. Well, we will uh, take that into the break. We are going into the break here at the bottom of the hour. We'll be back in three minutes. You are listening to Spirit's Journey on Truth Frequency Radio and Want Us Talk Radio, talking to Reverend Dr. Paula Hasselbeck when we get back, and we will see you on the other side. back from the break. If you are just joining us, this is Spirit's Journey with Patrick and Catherine Andrews. We're coming to you on Truth Frequency Radio, Oneness Talk Radio, among many others. We are here today with the Reverend Dr. Paul Hesselbeck having a very fascinating first half discussion about metaphysics and unity principles. Welcome back, Paul. Thank you. Happy to be with you. Well, Paul, uh, you made a comment in the first half of the show that so many people don't really know unity principles. So I want to know, why is that? Well, uh, so <laughs> I should address this one for sure with a big, strong, in my opinion, on the front end of this. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so um, here's why. A, a minister on Sunday morning has 20 minutes at best to convey a message. And most ministers are not willing to go to anything, go into anything deep in that 20 minutes because he or she is speaking to an audience that uh, from newbies to people who've been in unity for 30 years. And so they have to find a way to speak to them all. And usually that ends up with speaking at the lowest common denominator. Um, and, th and that's because you're pretty sure that everyone's going to understand. The place where unity teachings are learned are in the classes. And that's why I'm always happy when I hear a minister is promoting the classes. In fact, they couldn't be a minister if they didn't take the spiritual development classes, which is all about personal development. And then there's this one thing for sure working against the unity teachings. And um, I've said this at every level, so I'm not in any way, way intimidated of who might hear this. But the Daily Word, which is touted as unity's main publication, and indeed it is, is not written for people who understand unity. It's written as a outreach magazine to other Christian faiths, basically, and the majority, I think 75% of the people who get that magazine are non-unity people. So if you have someone reading from the platform, the Daily Word, especially a new person, the automatic logical assumption is what's being said in that Daily Word is, a uni is unity teachings. And by and large, it's not. And so 
there is a confusion, not even a confusion created because they don't even know that they're being confused. They're just hearing what's being said. And, and so that, that's why, I mean, I've had people, I've had people in my classes who were raised in unity. That means they went to unity um, Sunday schools and that. And when they get in the classroom, they're flabbergasted about what they didn't know. Well, so in Sunday school, they were taught by people who didn't understand Unity's teachings. And so what they got was their version of what Unity teaches. However, the big advantage people raised in Unity have, have they didn't grow up with this fear mongering, this guilt, um, a devil or anything like that, which does give them a leg up. Definitely, definitely. So, yeah. so that's why, um, so that's the best why I can give you. Now, I, I do want to add one more thing just to be really clear. So my specialty has been in not only reading the published texts, but digging into the archives, a lot of stuff that was unpublished. Now, stuff I found in unpublished, I can now find in the published works but let's say a little bit watered down. You can find across the decades of Unity writings almost any level of consciousness within the writings. And I focused on the writings that address the highest level of consciousness, which I call verity or truth consciousness, the absolute teachings. Most people fall in a category that is called, or I call, vessel consciousness. And it's, it's better than our traditional churches because it talks about God within us, the Christ within. However, people see that still as something separate from them, like, like a wiener's in the bun, the wiener's separate from the bun, and the bun's <laughs> separate from the wiener. So, so there's that, and, and at that level, the belief is God uses us. I'm an instrument for God. I'm a vessel for God. And, and all of those kinds of saying, sayings. It's an important step along the way, but it's not a place to stop. There's a higher understanding. And that's, that's what I advocate for. Well, and I appreciate the honesty with that, Paul, because the first part that you said that, you know, the minister's got 20 minutes and they don't, they're trying to appeal to maybe a newbie. And so they're going to be kind of general. And that, you know, I think exactly exemplifies my experience I've had with unity. And I'm always leaving like, I wish they'd go deeper. I wish they'd go deeper. And so I think it'd be an interesting experiment for uh, a church somewhere for the minister just to say, I'm going deep. I'm going deep. I don't care if there's a newbie out there because maybe it's an assumption that that would scare away the newbie. But maybe that's exactly what those newbies are looking for. And if they are just wanting to brush the surface, you know, maybe it, it isn't for them. Um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? What if we just said? Well, so, Catherine, you, you said something there that was really brilliant. And, and it's brilliant because no one stops to make the assumption that that newbie coming in through the door is looking for something new. And if the minister's going shallow, using traditional Christian language, the newbie is going to hear that from their current understanding. And so they're not going to really experience anything different. And I, since I'm not a church minister, since I travel and speak around the country, I speak right from the level from which I understand the teachings. I, and anyone can go online and find my talks you know, YouTube, at churches, and I don't dumb them down. I assume that every listener has the intelligence to understand what I'm saying, and I try to speak a language that is clear and simple. No, no jargon or as little jargon as possible. So what I mean by that, if I use the word God or Christ, which I don't use those terms much, I define them in the moment because I don't want the listener to use their definition of those terms. But by and large, more often, I avoid them as much as possible. You know, one of the things, because we were talking about dispelling some of the 
misconceptions or preconceptions that we have, and we, we talked at length in the first half about God, but there's also this sense that gets carried over from Christianity, and I was wondering if you find that popping up in the Unity Principles as you have studied them in terms of, you know, we, we talk about our threefold nature and you know, I grew up Catholic, so then it was, you know, the Holy Trinity, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So the this number three comes up a lot, and the kind of updated metaphysical perspective is, uh, you know, Father, Mother, Son, and different versions of that. So how do you how does how do you see that threefold nature uh, coming into this view and experience that you're talking about? Well, so there's a threefold nature of humankind, which Traditionally, is spirit, soul, body. Um, at, that's really more like spirit, little and mind, or personality and body. And spirit would be our divinity or or principle, actually. But then there's also the the three folds of spirit, and that's really founded on the traditional Trinity. Charles Fillmore was trying to connect unity uh, as a bridge or use Christian terms and uh, teachings as a bridge into unity. And so, yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and a lot of churches say Mother, Father, God. And took, those two are just way too anthropomorphic for me these days. But, so Charles did it in two steps. So he said God, Christ, Holy Spirit. So, so God is the new word for Father. Christ is the idea for the Son, not Jesus Christ, but Christ. And the Holy Spirit, frankly, I've done a lot of research on that in the writings. Uh, they really didn't land on anything interesting in the published works. I'll say more about that later. And then he further metaphysically interpreted to mind, idea, expression mind, idea, expression. And that is a very key metaphysical teaching because that is basically one of the most fundamental laws found in metaphysics, mind, idea, expression. And so uh, we can use that teaching as a way to apply what we know. And there's there's one really great unpublished uh, class that Charles gave to the ministerial students in the 30s that uh, has to do with the Holy Spirit. It's called Releasing the Holy Spirit of God in Man, which is not a good title, but in there, Charles clearly says the Holy Spirit is our mind. It's our little M mind. It's the way our mind works. And doesn't our mind work? Mind, idea, expression. And so that's the activity of mind idea in the absolute realm or, or God. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, made, that was a lot, yeah. lot, but I, boy, that was very insightful. And, you know, I think it's amazing that there are unpublished works that you've been able to delve into. And so I'm curious about a lot of movements, not just unity, whether it's Catholicism, you name it. I find a lot of people are afraid to go beyond what the original founders did or thought or believed. For example, a lot of time in unity, you know, uh, somebody say, I'll, I'll bring up a subject, astrology, whatever. And they'll say, oh, well, that's not that, that Charles didn't teach that or he didn't believe in that. Or, and it's like, I think in some, do you feel in some ways that there is this threshold or barrier that keeps people locked in? Um, a certain belief system and afraid to go beyond that because if the founders didn't say it, then it can't be or can't exist. Well, so that is really a very, very narrow point of view. And I, I, I can hear the way you're expressing it. We, we agree on this. If, if you, if you, if you make any attempt to read the material that Myrtle and Charles produced, uh, chronologically, you, you can perceive some shifts in, in their understanding and their language. And it's funny thing is, Charles, one of his famous 
sayings is he reserved the right to change his mind, <laughs> yeah. right? And which he did. But a lot of Unity people think that we don't have the right to change our minds. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a rabbit. If I, if I find something in current, especially in current science, that contradicts what was taught in Unity, you have to drop that teaching. That's just flat out. And so that's why I'm very, very invested in creating a metaphysics for the 21st century. You can call it unity metaphysics. You can call it Hasselbeck metaphysics. You can call it what, what you want. But we, we've got to let go of some of these things that we've held as true. And there's too much science proving that they're not true. So let me just give you two quick, quick examples. In all of New Thought, not just in Unity, you, you have a couple things, two primary things that are unidirectional. Uni, excuse me, unidirectional. And that is mind gives rise to thought, gives rise to feelings. That feelings always follow thought. Well, science is showing us now that feelings can precede thought. And so it's bidirectional. And I think... I think they actually both happen at the same time, but I don't have any science for that. So that's one thing we got to junk. The other thing is that thoughts and feelings somehow at some level, consciously, subconsciously produce our bodies. And that that's unidirectional, that the body has no effect on our minds. Well, we now know that's not true. And in fact, people who've done yoga for forever knew that that's not true. So, so that is bi-directional. And what that does for me, it shows me this, this concept that our divinity and our minds and our bodies are more like a unit. They, they influence and impact each other in, in both directions, so to speak. So, so there's that. those are just a couple things that I found that, that we need to clean up. Those are, those are big. And I was curious with the, the science showing that feelings can uh, precede thought. Was any of that um, done around the heart math? Because uh, I know they can measure, uh, you know, feelings and thoughts. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, th I don't think so. But if you go, so I don't have my book open here, but I have references in my heart centered metaphysics text. I, I, I put I put that research in there. So the research is at least, oh, 15 years old now. So if you just, if you just Google feelings precede thoughts, you will, you will find something about that. You know, it's interesting you bring that up because that is something, you know, I have a background in science also, and I've also been working to bridge the gap between science and spirituality and uh, you know, bringing that into updating metaphysics. And I found as I've been talking to people over the years, there seems to be more and more people with that kind of thinking. I remember even the Dalai Lama said at one time, because he really had a lot of confidence in what was being discovered scientifically. He said, you know, if our beliefs in Buddhism contradict what we're discovering with science, then we need to update our beliefs in Buddhism. And that is one of the things I discovered too, is that you know, sometimes you could call it a feedback loop or a feedback system, but you know that the body is influencing our feelings and our thoughts and our thoughts and feelings are influencing our body. So it is like this feedback system that can go both ways. And I like the way you describe it as bi-directional so that we don't think it's just this one way channel, because I think that's how I was originally taught when I was in my early days of metaphysics and really just kind of getting my feet wet and learning about it. Uh, there were a lot of people who were talking about it. Like you said before, it was just this one direction system it was like thought led to you know an emotion and that led to a physical expression and that's the only way that went but yeah that like when i do my teachings i updated it too so that you know to show people that it's a bi-directional system and that that it's like a feedback loop one one informs the other yes yeah, so what's important and well yeah so first of all we totally agree with joe second of all <laughs> is that i'm beginning to think that that thought and feeling are two sides of the same coin. And I like to talk about it as like a simile in, in comparing it to what we know in, in physics now. 
that everything has a particle function and a wave function. So this book I'm touching on my desk right now, since it's a physical object, is mostly particle function, but wave function is existing there as well. And if you look at a radio wave, it is 99.9999% wave function, but there's a tiny bit of it that's still particle function. And so if we think of thoughts and feelings that way, then we can see it as a range. And I really think that thought and feeling come together. It's just that a person who is primarily thinking nature is aware of their thought before the feeling, and the people who are primarily feeling nature are aware of their feelings before their thoughts. So for me, my premise is, is they're simultaneous. And, and I want to say something else, too, about this, this divide between spirituality and, and science. That happens when, when, when we have a, uh, a supernatural God that's a super being or something like that. However, as soon as you define God as principle and law, and, and you realize, or I realize, that, that the physical sciences, the sciences of nature, even the science of quantum, are fundamentally governed by principle and law. And, and those laws are just as immutable and unchangeable. And those principles are just as immutable and just as unchangeable as the spiritual laws and principles. In fact, in unity, when we talk about spiritual laws and principles, we're really talking about laws and principles of mind. And so what we have here is, is that there's not a separation at all. It's just a recognition that, that consciousness, that um, electricity, that gravity, that quantum, all are governed in an inactive way by principle and law. So for me, there's not a separation between God, which I define as principle and law, and, and everything else, because everything else is dependent on it. Uh, Paul, I wondered if you could talk, I'm always interested in the universal laws, I've studied them a lot, but when people bring in rules, you know, immediately a lot of people are turned off, rules. So I don't even know, uh, you know, the difference in terms of spirituality between laws and rules. And I wonder if you could okay. speak a little bit about that. This is a really important piece. So, so in, in our human societies, the laws that we make are really rules. They're, they can be broken. They can be changed. And so you, if you think about it, you think of the, the rules of the road or traffic, traffic laws. You, you see what I mean? We use the word law and rule interchangeably in, in this relative realm. However, when we're talking about the laws of science and the laws of mind, there are laws that are immutable, unchangeable, and you must follow them. You don't have a choice. The only choice we have with those laws is how we use them. And then mind, we have things that Charles and Myrtle called laws that are really rules. And you know it's a rule when you can break it, we can, when you can choose to not do it. The primary law that most people think is an immutable law, but is really a rule, is called the law of tithing. The law of tithing is breakable. I can choose not to tithe, but it's a damn good rule because it's, it's a method for practicing the principles of benevolence and generosity. If, if tithing was indeed a law, then you wouldn't even have to worry about practicing it because there would be some sort of automatic withdrawal from your bank account or from your prosperity. <laughs> Isn't, isn't that Obviously. called taxes, Paul? Yeah. <laughs> well, those are rules too. Those are rules. Yeah, yeah. So it's really important for us to be clear. So that so that big that test is if if you can break it, 
you're dealing with a rule. If you can't break it, you're dealing with a law. And I always tell people, and I don't know if you agree, that a lot of people see the laws as something, as a hindrance that's, you know, forcing them in a certain direction. And I always say, you know, when you understand the laws, they're really there for your own benefit and growth and to help you learn if you use them right. Well, so that, that, that's it. I mean, you, you can use them well, you can use them poorly. But it, the law is always operating just as it says it will operate. And the laws don't... F- See, here's the thing. We want to give agency, first of all, to God, which I don't believe in. We want to give agencies to law, which means they have the ability to act or do something. Well, the law of gravity just is the law of gravity. Those, and then we just put that in the big, big category but the gravity is functioning everywhere in the universe. The degrees to which it functions has to do with the size of bodies that are associated with it. But if you aren't paying attention, you can stumble and fall. You can crash an airplane. And, and it's not the law punishing you. It's just law doing what it does. And that's what we got to get clear on. And no matter how much you fight against it, it ain't going to change it because the laws are not changeable. Yeah, that's a really good point, because when you learn how to use it properly, then astronauts can actually use the law of gravity to accelerate their journey. Yes. You know, they sling slot, slingshot around a planet or something like that. So Exactly. Just, and pilots, flying a plane includes the laws of gravity. We wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be flying if we didn't have the laws of gravity. Right, right. Just, Very good point. So, so someone once said, it might have been someone who was teaching me when I was a pilot, that... Uh, Planes are always in a controlled fall. <laughs> oh, right. A pilot told me that one time, yeah. <laughs> well, and also the planes take off against the wind, not with it. Right, because there they're working with, with the laws of aerodynamics. Yeah. So we're winding down here. We're at the end of the show, and it's been amazing having you. You're always a wealth of information. Do you want to tell people quickly how they can get a hold of your books and and find all the books that we talked about in the beginning that you have written? Yeah, so a lot of them are available in the Unity Bookstore. They can write to me at Albert Hasselbeck at G, excuse me, Albert Hasselbeck at gmail.com. They can also go to my website, paulhasselbeck.com. And um, just Google me. I'm all over the place. I'm like dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are very well known in the Unity circles and uh, very easy to find, I'm sure, outside of the Unity uh, areas. So it has been a joy having you on the show today, Paul. And it's so great to have you know, somebody like you who's really delved into the deep, real, real stuff of Unity. So I'm going to have to get together and have coffee with you one of these days, Paul. And, and find out what's in these unpublished works. So you, you can explore for yourself on the Unity website. Just go to the archives, and there are ar- archival material unpublished of both Myrtle and Charles. Perfect. Yep. All right. Well, that's it for this show. So we love having you all with us. Please connect with us on Facebook at Spirits Journey Radio, and uh, be sure to like our page so we can be part of your life and you can be part of ours. You can study with us or get a reading with us at intuitiveschool.com. This has been Spirit's Journey on Truth Frequency Radio and Simulcast on Oneness Talk Radio, among others. I'm Patrick. I'm Catherine. Goodbye for now.